you shouldn't be afraid to to have your worldview challenged. Um, that um, you know, ultimately, I I think that what we believe is true uh, of the world, um, and because of that, you know, no, no matter what objections or counter arguments people might have, ultimately, this is going to 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 stand the test of time, and and really, it has stood the test of time, right, for two thousand years. Welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. I interview on the show major thought leaders from many fields of influence, showing how our worldview changes everything. My guest today, Dr. Tom Rodelius, he's a professor of physics at Durham University in England. His research focuses on, get this, quantum field theories, early universe cosmology, and string theory. But you think about that stuff every day, right? He has a recent book, Chasing Proof, Finding Faith, A Young Scientist's Search for Truth in a World of Uncertainty. This is an amazing conversation because here you got this guy who's got a PhD in physics from Harvard University who had a journey to an unexpected faith and realized that there is compelling evidence for Christianity that is compatible with science. Not only that, he saw how the way of Jesus offers a flourishing vision to live by. This is going to be amazing. Please welcome Dr. Tom Rodelius to the show. Tom Rodelius, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. Yeah, thanks a lot. Great to be here. You are in Durham right now. Uh, you're in England. And and, and you're a professor of physics there. So when we're doing this show, it's late afternoon here in Colorado. It's late at night there. So I just want to say, first of all, thank you for staying up to talk with our audience. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really my pleasure. Yeah. I, I'd love to hear a little bit about your story. You know, the narrative that most people have embraced over the last hundred years or so is that faith and science are two different ways of knowing about things that faith is actually not a way of knowing. It's a, it's a fake way of knowing. It's a way of avoiding difficult questions and that all, tr you know, what's really true is going to come to us through science. And I just felt like, man, this is an elephant in the room. We just got to bring it up. We just got to talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm glad that you phrased that the way you did, because that's almost exactly how I phrase the, the common sentiment of, um, of how people view the relationship between science and faith, that people tend to view it as these two totally opposite approaches to the same questions. And I think something that I've really come to find um, as someone who's walked that journey of science and walked that journey of faith, that I would say that for me, um, my approach to my science and my approach to my faith are, are actually quite similar approaches to different questions. I think that science generally does a, a better job at do, dealing with questions about mechanisms and how the world works and how it's come to be. And I think that, uh, that faith does a better job of answering the why questions of what's our meaning and purpose and why are we here in the first place. I remember Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs saying something to that effect in his book about faith and science, uh, that science takes things apart to see how they work. Faith puts things to religion, puts things together to see what they mean. Is that a statement you would agree with? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about your science journey a little bit first. How did you become interested in physics and decide to pursue that as a career? Yeah. So, um, I mean, there are a few things that kind of went into that. Um, I, growing up, I was always good at, at math. I was always good at science. Um, and I always found, um, cosmology and, and astronomy, especially interesting, just kind of mind boggling how big the universe is and, um, just what sort of crazy things happen in it. Um, when I went to college, uh, two big things, uh, that really, I would say pushed me along this journey. Um, one is that I had some really good professors uh, in physics, uh, people who I wanted to follow and walk in their footsteps. One one professor in particular who was my general relativity professor my junior year. Um, <laughs> then the other thing, the other thing was that I came to faith in college, and um, and you know it was so growing up I had grown up in a very non-religious family, hadn't thought too much about it, but. Come, the process of coming to faith, I started thinking a lot more about these big questions. Um, and I think that that really pushed me into asking questions like, what are the fundamental laws of nature? Um, 
And as, I, as I've already said, you know, I think that there are some questions that physics can't answer for us and that, that, that we really need to turn to metaphysics and philosophy and theology. Um, but I think that with my background combined with my desire to understand the universe at a fundamental level, that really pushed me into this field that I'm in today. I'd love to hear about the, the, the convergence of your, your faith journey and your, your science journey, your academic journey. If, you know, if I can just talk about this for a moment, I think a lot of people in the States think that college is a place where a lot of Christian kids go to lose their faith. And here your story is that you came to faith in college. Like that's the opposite narrative. So what, what happened? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'd say there's actually a sense in which I also lost my faith um, in college, but it was just a different faith, right? It was, it was sort of this worldview that I had internalized growing up that, you know, the point of religion is to help us live happy lives and to be more moral people. And I always figured, hey, I'm a pretty happy person. You know, I have a lot of good things in my life that I, with, without religion, and, uh, and I think I'm a pretty moral person. So why do I really need religion? Um, and what happened in college is um, the first big thing is that my twin brother came to faith. Uh, he went to Northwestern, just outside of Chicago. I went to Cornell in upstate New York. Um, my brother came to faith through conversations with some of the guys he met, uh, some, uh, some guys on his floor freshman year. And, uh, and he, he started talking with me about faith, trying to share his newfound faith with me. Uh, I realized for the first time, you know, I've brought a lot of faith assumptions of my own to the table, even if I wouldn't have called them faith, you know, even if I would have said I wasn't actually religious, I too had a worldview. I too had this, uh, this mindset that I was bringing to the table. And the more I started to think about it and question it, um, the more I started to realize that a lot of those assumptions weren't justified. And that's what led me down, uh, or at least started me down the path uh, to ultimately Christianity. Talk a little bit about those, those key questions or assumptions that you began to challenge. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think one of the very first questions was, was this question of science, you know, um, that I had internalized this idea that, you know, what, what you said so eloquently at the beginning that, that religion and faith is just sort of this outdated system that we modern scientifically minded people can no longer accept, you know, that we have better ways of doing things now. Um, and in particular, something that, that bothered me at first was this whole possibility of miracles, that miracles play a foundational role in the Christian story. And, um, you know, I, I kind of like this idea of these immutable laws of physics that, uh, that the universe just follows. And there didn't seem to be much role, much room in, in that worldview, I guess, for, the miracles that um, the Christianity says happened. So it was, that was maybe one of the first objections. And I think it didn't take me too long to come to this idea that while science maybe can tell us how the world works in the absence of supernatural intervention, it's not in the business of telling us whether that intervention is possible in the first place, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and even if we were, even if miracles are exceedingly rare, right? Um, well, maybe there's a reason why, God or whatever the design, you know, whatever the, whoever's in charge, uh, whatever I would have, whatever word I would have used back then. Um, maybe there's, maybe it has a good reason every once in a while on rare occasions for, for doing something extraordinary. Um, and so it didn't take me, I think too long to get past that sort of objection. And that was just kind of one of you know, what was a little bit of a, of a, like a thread on unraveling, right. Of a lot of the worldview that I brought to the table, I started to question and say, Hey, maybe this, Maybe this isn't the only way that things could be. It was your twin brother also studying in science. Uh, he was an economics major. Oh, okay. Yeah, he, he, uh, he, he today is in, uh, he's worked in, in ministry full time ever since graduating. So he's left that, that world a little bit behind. Um, but yeah, he was an economics major back in the day. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Well, you, in your professorship, are also working in a field of ministry, I guess you could say, from a worldview perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, some, I've, I've had a lot of different experiences within my field uh, of people of their different religious faiths. Um, and that's a question I get a lot is, you know, is it, what's it like being a, a professor? You know, kind of this assumption that, um, that everyone is going to be very hostile. 
uh, towards a person of faith in the sciences. And, and I found a little bit of that, to be sure. But I've also actually found sometimes um, that even even non-religious scientists will stick up for religious people to other non-religious scientists. Um, and I found some really strong um, Christians, some some people, some very devout followers of other faiths as well. Um, so I do think that th- that my worldview is is fairly unique um, and fairly special within my world. But um, but as I say, you know, I, I'd say it's a really wide spe- spectrum within within the world of theoretical physics, just like in any other community. You're, you've written a book, and it's called Chasing Proof and Finding Faith. I love the title because in those four words, it's an invitation to explore a much bigger life story. <laughs> Chasing yeah. Proof, Finding Faith. Um, what is it that you were hoping to find when you started out in your spiritual journey? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think that you know, ultimately what I would have liked to believe, um, even, even, you know, growing up, even as I started along this journey is that I really wanted something more, that there would be something more than just, you know, like I live and I die and that's the end of me. Like I, I had this, uh, and I've always had this hope that, you know, that there's an afterlife, that in heaven or some, something like what, what I think of as heaven exists. Um, but I also, as I said, as a, uh, the case of miracles shows, I also just had this thought that, you know, probably at the end of this journey, I'm just going to conclude that like this, this stuff is probably all just made up, um, that I would have liked to believe that God existed, but I just, thought that rationally I, I wouldn't come to that conclusion. Um, so it was chasing, it, it, it was chasing proof in a sense, but it was also sort of chasing it with this idea that this doesn't seem like it's actually going to work out. Hmm. Hmm. Was there a sort of an incident or something that happened where that became really clear to you? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what sort of the climactic moment of the book, um, is this experience I had with the National Security Agency um, taking a polygraph test? I was trying to get a top secret security clearance to for this internship uh, that I had applied for, and I went in to this internship. And my view towards it, kind of similar to my views towards heaven, uh, towards religion in general, which is, hey, I'm a pretty good person, you know, um, like. Sure, this test is is made to like screen out the really bad people, um, but I'm I'm a good person. I'm a good guy, and I'm gonna have no no trouble. Um, I went in, I started failing, and I realized pretty quickly that I was going to fail not only if I was lying, but just if I felt guilty about anything. So for about four hours, I shared everything I could think of that I'd done wrong in my life, and all of a sudden, this message that my brother had been telling me uh, about uh, about how people are broken and in need of a savior. That started to, started to make sense to me. Um, I realized that, you know, hey, beneath my pretty good resume and the fact that I'm generally a nice guy, like deep down, I've, I've done a lot of things I'm not proud of. And deep down, I'm not as good as I'd like to think I am. And it was in that moment when this whole Christian message, I would say, um, about not, you know, not only that I'm sinful, but also that there is a God who, who's come, who loves me enough to forgive me of that 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 whole story started to make sense. Um, and so I think it wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily that the arguments changed, you know, it's not like I heard one new argument that just kind of like made everything click. Um, it was more that all of these, these arguments that my brother had been telling me about that I'd been reading about as I looked more and more into Christianity, that those just hit as I'd had this new experience that in, in light of, you know, the person that I was now, you know, Christianity just made sense of the world. And, and I think that as I've gotten older, as I've learned more, both scientifically and just had more life experience, um, I would say even more so than then, that, that Christianity just makes better sense. It makes the best sense of the world around me. That's a great story. I love that. I can only imagine what that experience is like. It's like a, it's like a, a confession, confessional on steroids, right? It really is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's like the secular version of a confessional. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. 
I've been very interested in looking at faith science. It's something I, I, I thought about. I try to read about that. I didn't come up in that in the, the world of science. I'm more in the social social sciences area. But I've always been fascinated by how many of the great figures in science were people of a Christian faith. And I, I, I remember hearing, I think John Lennox wrote this on his blog, and I don't know the source of it, but he said, look, two-thirds of the people who've ever won the Nobel Prize in science list Christian as their affiliation. And a 20% uh, list that they're Jewish, which is fascinating because Jewish people make up such a tiny percentage of the world's population. It's almost like there's something about monotheistic belief that facilitated science. That's the impression that I get just looking at the raw statistic. And I'm just curious what that looks like on a daily basis for you. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, as I say, I interact uh, at, like at a sociological level with, with people from, from many different faiths and many different backgrounds. Um, I, I would say that, you know, as, as far as thinking about not only it, it, is that the case, but ought that to be the case. I, I think that, mm -hmm. um, there is something special, and this is something I think a lot, you know a lot of people tend to view the god of theism as sort of like this little magical fairy who who wanders around inside our universe and is sort of just cowering in the face of scientific progress. But really, the view of of, of monotheism is that God is the the lawgiver. That God has decreed these natural laws that describe the world around us, and I think that you know that's something that. That for on an atheistic worldview, that you just kind of take the fact that our universe follows these laws is just sort of a brute fact without any explanation, just a bit of cosmic serendipity. Um, and on a polytheistic worldview, uh, I mean, you think, for instance, of like the ancient Greek gods, right, where you have a god that's in charge of of lightning and a god that's in charge of earthquakes, and you can kind of see how that perspective, uh, that theological view is going to start to run into trouble as you learn more and more about the universe. It's like, well, actually, random, lightning strikes seem to be pretty random. Uh, you know, earth, mm -hmm. earthquakes, you know, I don't know if there's really a different God in charge of that. And so um, I, I think that there is something unique that, you know, if we could like run history back again, that it does seem to me likely that somehow monotheism is ultimately going to lead to this perspective. That, that, that is a prerequisite for science, that there has to be some sort of order, some sort of lawgiver behind all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that if there's an order, there's an orderer. Would seem to be the natural thing that would occur, you know, occur to you unless, yeah, you, yeah. unless you've, you've been talked out of it. it like that would be the right. reflex yeah. action of most people. Yeah. I think so. Man, yeah. I'd love to hear a, a little bit about the students that you work with. Um, you know, we're, a lot of what we do at Summit Ministries is working with young adults, 16 to 22 years of age, coming together, bringing Christian thought leaders together and, you know, science, economics, philosophy, theology, all these different areas to help them really gain some clarity and confidence about their biblical worldview. What are you seeing with your students? Because you're teaching at a, a, a well-known top university and your students yeah. taking your courses are very bright. What are you observing? Yeah, uh, like what am I observing as far as like their their faith? What am I? Yeah, their faith or what how they're doing in their lives. I mean, we hear all these yeah, stories yeah. about anxiety and depression and lack of purpose and things like that. I'm just I'm just curious what your experience is as a professor. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow, I feel like that's that's another question that's difficult because you do see such a wide um, a wide spectrum. I think. It is, you know, as I've gotten started to get a little bit older, it does seem like there is kind of more of a disconnect, uh, every, you know, every year between myself and and the students. And I think that, um, you know, one one big difference uh, that you see um, is sort of how much the um, so I would say uh, social media, but also just. So, their social circles um, affect what people believe and, and how they act. And I guess that probably when I was a student, which wasn't all that long ago, I'm sure that all of the older people would have said the exact same thing about me and, and my generation. Um, hmm. 
but I think that it's something that I've I've kind of reflected on, and you get to see maybe a little bit more as you get, as I get older and wiser, is how much of what we believe is not because we're these sort of independent, completely rational thinkers, um, but so much of what we believe is connected to I think this des- deep desire to belong. That's something that uh, a good friend of mine, my my mentor in Boston, who did a PhD on evangelism, um, named Pat McLeod, uh, and sort of as he studied campus ministry, one of the big things he, the main takeaways was that for most students who come to faith in college, belonging precedes believing, that most of them f- uh, come to be a part of, of a church or a Christian community that they really feel like they belong in before they be- come to believe. Um, and I would say that, you know, the same, that's not, that's not just within Christianity. I would say that for, for any belief system, you know, that when people really get excited about um, some political party or another, or some sports team or another, right? That there's always sort of this sense of, or almost always the sense of belonging that perceives that sense of believing. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's an important thing to think as we think about with these young students and especially um, in the terms of ministry, you know, how do we get these students to really belong and feel like they belong within the church community? That really does lead me to to the next question because I think we've talked a little bit about how your faith interacts with your science, but I'm curious what that looks like the other way around. Does your, the science that you do in theoretical physics have a bearing on your life of faith? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that, uh, that one thing that I've, as I do more and more science, um, something I really co- have come to appreciate is the role that uncertainty plays in our lives. Um, and this is a big uh, th- theme of my book as well. Um, uh, even even the subtitle like is, is about uncertainty, right? That I think, and I think this is something that, again, from an outsider's perspective, it's like science just deals with like hard truths and brute facts. Uh, but what I, what you actually find, I think, once you enter the world of science, Uh, is that there's a lot of uncertainty. I mean, every every scientific experiment has error bars and uncertainties. Um, And at the cutting edge of science, you know, there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of debate because, because we don't know for sure, right? Like there are, there are rare cases in science where you just like absolutely find the truth and like everyone is convinced, but more often you're kind of dealing with experiments that may have some issues and you're dealing with arguments that, well, they rely on some approximations, and then you have to argue about whether those approximations are valid. Um, And I think that, in general, um, as I've gotten older, has just made me, I would say, more more okay with the uncertainties that exist in our lives, including the uncertainties that come with the mysteries of faith. You know, Um, I think that there are aspects of, of our faith that I understand quite well. There are a lot of things that I've would, would love to have answered, you know, a lot of questions, uh, how does God like make free will versus his sovereignty fit together as one, you know, all all these sorts of mysteries that, um, I think, you know, I've come to realize as I've gotten further in science, I have a lot of mysteries like that in the scientific realm as well, you know, and I, and I could be okay with that. You know, I don't like lose sleep over the, the questions of, of quantum gravity, um, and so I think it's okay to, to have those questions for faith as well. Um, and to just say that some, that that's the world that we live in, you know, and we have to try to make a path within this world of uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really powerful. I was just thinking of, um, yeah, I, I was reading some books in economics last year and it's several of them. It was so strange circled back around to the idea of the, you know, the uncertainty, uh, principle, the, the idea that there are many things that we must assume to be true that we cannot prove in order to understand anything else. You know, and there's there certain fields like economics where you just yeah. think, man, I just can't, if that's true, this is so discouraging because that means fundamentally I am not in control of anything that I'm actually getting to study. Yeah. Right. But I think, I think, you know, that ultimately where that, that, I think should lead us is to, is to a greater sense of humility. Um, mm. And, uh, and I think that's kind of where maybe the, uh, the, as Christians we're sort of called to be is, is being like, like being okay with not being our own gods. Um, I think that 
for me, you know, a big part of my journey as well is, um, is wrestling with anxiety. Um, and at times like these obsessive doubts, uh, about whether or not my faith is real. Um, and you know, I mean, it's, I could, I could like go into another season of anxiety again in a week. I don't know because it's kind of comes and goes for me. Um, but I, I would say lately, you know, as I've gotten older, as I'm, I think, you know, settling more into, into the faith and into this worldview that I now call my own, that some of that anxiety ha has gone away. Um, and just learning to be okay with, with saying, you know, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to live this out. Um, even despite some of these questions that I might have. Um, because as you say, you know, as I say that those questions are going to persist no matter what your worldview is, no matter what your, uh, field of study is, that there's always going to be some mysteries that are left to be resolved. Yeah. Tom, I'd love to hear what your faith community is like. Did you, when you came to faith as a college student, first of all, was that through a church? You may have said, and I just maybe missed it, yeah. but then how does, how does the, how does being involved in a community of faith sort of play into your spiritual journey? Yeah. Um, so when I first came to faith, um, it was pretty much my, my community was my twin brother, um, mm -hmm. where we had lots of conversations. He gave me some books about Christianity re to read. I, uh, I told the first time he tried to give me those books, I told him, look, Steve, I have trouble finding time to read books that I want to read, much less time to read books that I don't want to read. Um, <laughs> but Steve started, he started going to church over the summer. And so I tagged along and, um, and then I went back to school and, uh, and even as I was learning more, even as I was kind of starting to think like, I, I you know, I think like I might be a Christian, like I might believe this stuff. Um, it, it actually wasn't until a few months after that, like polygraph conversion experience of mine that I, um, I just sort of randomly was on an intramural basketball team with a guy who played, uh, sorry, who, who worked for a campus ministry, uh, at Cornell. And so after our last playoff game, we got eliminated and I went up to him and said, Hey, Nick, I'm, uh, you know, I just became a Christian and I'm looking for like a way to get involved. Um, so it was actually kind of a freak accident, uh, that I accident, like actually stumbled into a real Christian community. Um, but, uh, you know, it, in respect, like I'm, I'm very, very, very glad I did. I, I think that that has been one of, if not the greatest, um, like benefits, I guess I would say, I mean, okay. Number, number one is like hope for eternal life, but, yeah. but number two, I think is like that community, that family. Uh, of people. And I mentioned a few minutes ago that some of the anxiety and, and really difficult seasons of mental health issues that I've had. And I think that those times, especially, it's been just so important for me to have the, that community of faith, uh, people who can, who will pray for me, who will, you know, come alongside me in some of those hard times. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think that's really a special, a special thing. And re I really have found that to be true that, that it is like a family, you know, that, that is Christians, yeah. Um, it's more than just a community that they're really, really, the bonds that tie us together are so tight that it is really more like a family. Yeah, man, Tom, it, it means a lot to me that you would be vulnerable about the, those, that struggle and how your community has, has meant so much to you. And that I'm especially touched by that, that you would share that, you know, I know we're, we're talking about faith and science and talking about your book, but that you would share that and how the body of Christ has really uh, come alongside you in those tough seasons. That may, that may, that's going to be a huge takeaway for me. And I know for a lot of people who are watching and listening. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, yeah, for me, it's like, I couldn't really give an honest account of my faith journey. I feel like without talking about some of that stuff, but um, as I have talked about it and I wrote about it quite extensively in my book, um, something I've just found is how many other people have had similar experiences that yeah. um, a lot of us, I think, feel kind of alone in those experiences. And that's something that, again, that the community has really helped me to see is like, actually, this is this is kind of normal. You know, I mean, it mm -hmm. like it sucks. It sucks to have those sorts of um, struggles. But it, it's also something that's, you know, again, that I can really find that I can really bond with others over. Yeah. Well, this is awesome. I, I know for our students at Summit Ministries who are in the STEM fields, 
this is going to be a huge encouragement. And I'm very excited about the about your book, Chasing Proof, Finding Faith. Tom, as you as you have a chance to speak to this rising generation, you know, do you do this as a professor, but a lot of the people who are watching or listening are sort of moving into their university experience and moving into their career. And I wonder if you have any just advice as an older brother. Yeah. So, um, I would say that especially for the students of faith, um, that you shouldn't be afraid to, to have your worldview challenged. Um, that, um, you know, ultimately I, I think that what we believe is true uh, of the world. Um, and because of that, you know, no, no matter what objections or counter arguments people might have, ultimately this is going to, to, to stand the test of time. And, and really it has stood the test of time, right? For 2000 years that, um, so yeah, that's the first thing I'd say is, is don't be afraid to be exposed to new ideas. Um, but I would also say that in that, um, and I, I sound like a broken record, but in that it, it really is important to have a, a faith community. Um, my, my wife uh, told me about this study actually that, that looked into um, like, what are the most important factors for young people in, uh, in whether or not they like lose their faith as they get older. Um, and again, this is secondhand. So like I, I might get a detail wrong here, but my understanding is that like the most important, um, factor was that they should, that they would have intergenerational faith relationships. Yes. Um, in other words, I think it's, I think it's very important. And it was very important for me as a college student to have, to see other college students who are, who are people of faith, um, and to see what that looked like. But I think it's also just as important, if not more important to be part of a church community that has people of different generations. So you can see what it's like, um, to, to walk that path of faith, you know, into your twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, hundreds. Right. And I think that's something that really does help give a, a new perspective that a lot of the, you know, and I'd say, I'm sure you would say this, Jeff, that like all the things that we thought were like catastrophic troubles when we were like teenagers, Looking back, you're like, why was I worried about that? Um, you know, and that continues, right? Like, I'm sure that someday I'll look back and, and the things that I view as struggles today and say, why was I worried about that? And I think that having those intergeneral, intergenerational faith relationships can really help give that perspective on life. Yeah, I love it. I was just with a group of students yesterday and I, I had them repeat after me, I need old people. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they all laugh, <laughs> yeah. but they all realized, yeah, that's really true. That's really true. As much as we think that we're all really that is. as a generation, we know that we need people to connect us across generations, that life's more like a family reunion than it is like a class. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think something for me that's been so valuable too in, in some of these times of, of like struggle and suffering, which, which really come for all of us, right? That all of us at some point are going to have that. And to be able to see the people who are, you know, like in their 80s and who have lost like so loved ones, you know, who have lost their spouses um, and yet who are still like clinging so strongly to God that yeah. um, you really just see learn how to suffer well. And I think that that's something that I I hope will be like the theme of of the next however many decades of my life is is learning that again and again. And I think it's so important to be able to learn that from from, from our, uh, elders. Yeah. Wow. Man, that's good stuff. Man, I'm really grateful that you came on the show today. I hope that the, the book goes really well and, uh, best to you in, in your career. And thank you for the way you approach these, these questions in a way that just gives us a calm sense of confidence in God and in his plan for the world. And in, in, in the midst of living in a world where there's so much confusion about what's actually true. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. And thanks again for having me on. Thank you to my guest, Dr. Tom Rodelius, for coming on the show today. This podcast is a resource of Summit Ministries. At Summit, we exist to come alongside the rising generation, their trainers, parents, and influencers, so that the young people in your life may know God's truth and become champions of a biblical worldview. So if you're looking for more resources, you can check out Tom's book about chasing proof, finding faith. You can go to our website, summit.org slash resources, where you'll find all kinds of free content that can help you. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.
Thank you for listening to today's episode. The Dr. Jeff Show podcast is a resource of Summit Ministries. Summit equips and supports the rising generation to embrace God's truth and champion a biblical worldview. If you want more resources that can help you live out a biblical worldview as a student or reach the next generation as an educator, church leader, or parent, head over to summit.org slash resources to find out about the programs, the articles, the videos, the eBooks, and more that we offer. Also, if you're looking for more great podcasts that will build your faith and inspire you, our friends at Edify have what you need. You can find more podcasts, including the Dr. Jeff Show podcast, on the Edify app. Download it at edify.app, spell E-D-I-F-I, and then you can also search for it in the Apple Store or the Google Play Store.